our virtual event today is Innovation and Team Science for Greater Impact. Dr. Moody E. Altamimi, founding director of the Office of Research Excellence, will moderate a panel of leading scientists and engineers whose careers were impacted by innovation and team science at an early stage. They will share tips for ensuring a successful career in research and development. If you would like to post to Facebook about this event, please use the hashtags the HKN Experience and HKNX2020. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Altamimi. Thank you very much, Stacy. Hi, everyone. My name is Moody Altamimi. I'm from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. We're truly grateful for the opportunity to assemble this distinguished panel of experts and share with you our thoughts about two important competencies that are critical to your success in achieving greater impact in your careers, team science and innovation. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with national laboratories. Um, the US Department of Energy National Laboratories are a system of facilities and laboratories overseen by the Department of Energy for the purpose of advancing science and technology to fulfill its mission for ensuring America's security and prosperity. Oak Ridge is one of 17 national laboratories under the Department of Energy and has the nation's most diverse research and development portfolio. So ORNL uh, was established as part of the Manhattan Project in World War II 75 years ago. Since then, they continue to deliver advances in science and technology across various research areas materials and chemical processes, advanced manufacturing and energy systems, biological and environmental systems, neutron science, computing and data analytics, and national security. To solve difficult problems that matter, ORNL brings teams together from different disciplines, experiences, and cultures. For today's panel, we'll share with you why are we passionate about promoting team science and innovation. At the end of the panel, we hope that you develop an understanding and appreciation for collaboration across disciplines and how different perspectives can support innovative thinking that will lead to greater impact. Each panel member will provide a brief overview of their background and the impact of these competencies on their research careers. The rest of the time is designated for question and answers uh, again, as Stacy mentioned, please do submit your questions in the designated area, and I'll be more than happy to ask on your behalf as the moderator. So I think we're uh, ready to start. Uh, allow me to present Professor Betsy Rowland. Uh, Betsy is the Director of Team Science plus Research Development for the Carbon Cancer Center and the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research at the University of Wisconsin-Medicine. She has a PhD in human-centered design and engineering and a master of library and information sciences, both from the University of Washington and a master of public health from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Rollins research focuses on coordination and collaboration in team science projects, including how to design, build and evaluate infrastructure to support complex multi-investigator initiatives. Dr. Roland, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, and we Can we see the slides? Can everybody see the slides up on the live view? The yellow, I can see the main slide. Okay. Sorry, for me there, it's showing not at the beginning. Can I do push to audience? There's a live view Dr. link. Dr. Roland. The... Go ahead. Yes. Dr. Roland, your impact of team science and interdisciplinary research on innovation slide is now showing to the audience. Okay. All right. So I'm so, I'm so sorry that, but I can't. What I see of you is slide 40 of 48. Okay. Uh, what is showing to the audience is slide two of 48. Okay, fantastic. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. 
Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, interdisciplinary research and team science and its impact on innovation. So what do we mean when we talk about team science? So uh, the National Research Council, here we'll go to the slide. Um, the National Research Council uh, defines team science as scientific collaboration, i.e. research um, conducted by more than one individual in an interdependent fashion, including research conducted by small teams and larger groups. Some of those definitions focus on interdisciplinary teams. And in my opinion, this isn't a so useful definition. Um, and people ask me all of the time, is what I'm doing team science? I generally say, if you're working with other researchers who don't report to you on a project that you couldn't do just within your own lab or research group, you're probably doing team science. All right, so are we on? To, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm still not seeing um, um, the, the slides here. I'll be more than happy yes. to move the slides because I have control. So all you have to do is tell me next slide and I'll be more than happy to push the yellow arrow. Can you hear me? Am I back now? Yes. Okay, my apologies to everyone. I, I refreshed my screen and now I can see it. Thank you so much. So thinking about interdisciplinary research, we use a variety of terms, often interchangeably, to talk about research involving multiple disciplines. And we often use this fruit smoothie analogy to explain the differences among the terms. Unidisciplinary research is the traditional definition of a discipline, represented here as an apple. It's one type of fruit, easy to distinguish and from other fruits, and it's often eaten alone. You might think of biology or mechanical engineering or sociology. Multidisciplinary research engages more than one discipline, but those disciplines might operate independently and sequentially with not a lot of interactions between or among the disciplines. This type of research is represented here by the fruit basket. Each piece of fruit is still whole and easily distinguished from the others, but they are together in the basket. Interdisciplinary research is the next level of integration with work being done jointly, maybe more interactions among the disciplines. And here we represent interdisciplinary research with the fruit salad. You can still see generally which fruit is which, but they're mixing together and maybe the flavors are melding a bit. And the final orientation is transdisciplinary, which is characterized by integration, interdependence, and emergence. You might see shared vocabularies and entirely new methods or perspectives. Transdisciplinary research is represented here by the smoothie. You don't notice the individual fruits that went into the smoothie. In fact, there might even be some kale in there that you don't notice. And the taste is the sum of all the parts coming together to create something new and different. In practice, these terms might be used in many different ways and mean very different things to different people. And the main area where the distinction is important is when you're submitting grant proposals to agencies or solicitations that use one of these terms in a specific way. And you should be sure to do the same. Much of what we know about how teams operate and how to effectively support teams comes from the field of the science of team science, or CITES, itself a multidisciplinary field. CITES draws from fields such as organizational psychology, teams research, human-centered design, sociology, information science, and others. So what does that field tell us about how teams work? We know that the amount of research being done in teams is expanding. These plots are taken from a 2000 paper published in Science by a team at Northwestern University. On the left, you can see that the percentage of papers and patents published by teams between 1960 and 2000 increased dramatically. And on the right, you can also see that the mean team size for those papers and patents also increased dramatically. So the takeaway here is that more science is being done in teams. So if you're engaged in research, you'll most likely be doing so in teams. We also know that teams are more productive. This paper by Dr. Kara Hall and her team at the NCI looked at the T-Turks program, a transdisciplinary initiative focused on tobacco and compared, compared productivity as measured by publications for the T-Turk centers with stacked R01s, which are a group that had one R01, um, like a major research project, and they got another focused on the same topic and a long R01, which is teams whose R01s were uh, renewed for an additional five years. And this is an NIH term for these large, larger projects, the R01s. And you can see on the left that the T-Turks started more slowly, but ended up with substantially more publications per year over the 10 years. And on the right, the cumulative publications were also much higher. 
So the transdisciplinary teams needed more time to get going, but once they did, they were more productive. What else do we know about the impact of interdisciplinary teams? We know that teams, team products have documented impact on society and economic growth, that team research is cited at a higher frequency and their patents are more likely to be licensed, the team approach fosters innovation and greater retention of advancements. Teams, as we just sh showed, have higher publication rates than collections of projects, and participants in teams have enhanced satisfaction. We also know uh, and have been exploring how team science best practices can increase the reproducibility of our research. Research builds upon discoveries that have come before. So reproducibility of the research is incredibly important as we need to really feel confident that the future discoveries are built on a solid foundation. And in this paper, we propose that interventions that focus on building team-based reproducibility behaviors from the beginning, targeting the process of research and taking into account competing incentives can really create an environment within the team that supports that reproducibility that we're looking for. And a bonus feature is that we know that these team science best practices also lead to higher impact science overall. So team science is all about diversity. And Dr. Gray notes, the achievement of major transdisciplinary innovations hinges on whether leaders have the capacity to enable deep diversity to thrive while simultaneously forging the integration across disciplinary boundaries within their teams. So team science is all about diversity across a number of facets, including disciplinary diversity, professional, meaning you know, academics working with industry, Demographic diversity, career stage, early stage investigators and senior professors might have very different needs from their collaborative work and personality type and work style. However, I will note that the, team, the field of team science is grappling with the issues of diversity, equity, inclusion as much as any other field. I mentioned earlier that teams tend to be more innovative and produce more high impact work. In part, this is because innovation comes from applying existing ideas in new ways or new contexts. Papers that did this were twice as likely to be highly cited works, an indicator of idea dispersion and uptake. Furthermore, that same team at Northwestern that I mentioned earlier found that teams are nearly 40% more likely than solo authors to insert novel combinations into familiar knowledge domains, resulting in greater innovation. One project that exemplifies this is the WAVES project here at Wisconsin. I won't try to give you all the details, but the upshot is that astronomers figured out a way to account for the distortion of light as they measured things in space. And that discovery is now being applied by ophthalmology researchers to see more clearly into the retina. The WAVES collaboration brings together clinicians, ophthalmology experts, data scientists, and engineers to devise the instruments, algorithms, and protocols for using this new approach. We know that team composition matters for scientific outcomes. We know that more diversity is better. Teams that are less diverse typically have lower levels of performance, in large part because it's harder for them to think outside the box. We know that a higher fraction of incumbents versus comers is better, as those experienced collaborators contribute expertise and know-how to the team, but they also benefit from bringing in new team members, but only up to a point. Onboarding new team members can not only be time-consuming, it can change the culture of a team, for better or worse. To increase creativity in your own work, I encourage you to engage with new collaborators. Don't only repeat the collaborations with the same team members because then you risk stifling your innovation. And you should collaborate with the brokers, people who have large disparate sets of collaborators because they are more likely to draw from a more diverse reservoir of knowledge and thus perform better. And finally, become a broker yourself. Get to know people in different disciplines, different institutions, who are focused on different problems than what you're working on. What you see on the right there is the professional network of my good friend, Dr. Holly Falk Krasinski, who, as you can see, has an enormous network of collaborators all around the world. And every time that I collaborate with Holly, I have access to that network. So I'll close here by sharing with you my interdisciplinary path. In high school and college, I worked as a server in restaurants. At Northwestern, I majored in Russian, then moved to Moscow and taught English and worked in a food import company all just a few years after the fall of the Soviet Union. On return to the US, I worked a variety of administrative jobs and then studied computer science at San Francisco State and worked in software companies during the dot-com boom. During the initial phases of the Human Genome Project, I became very interested in scientific collaboration and how researchers were managing these massive databases and the information of the project. 
So I went to the University of Washington to do a Master of Library and Information Science. I'll point out that at this point, I was 33 and had a one-year-old. After completing my MLIS, I took a job at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, facilitating team science projects, which eventually led me to go back to school again, just before I turned 40, by the way, to complete PhD in human-centered design and engineering. After graduation, I went to the National Cancer Institute as a postdoctoral cancer prevention fellow, taking my engineering approach to facilitating team science to the mothership and then came to Wisconsin, where I focus on building infrastructure to support teams in translational and cancer research. I wanted to really highlight the fact that every step on this path has contributed in some way to my skill set and my ability to innovate. For example, I specifically included server here on this slide because so much of what I do in my roles is being highly organized, being able to anticipate what researchers need, not to mention dealing with occasionally difficult people. Every experience that you have, every field you explore, gives you tools, skills, and knowledge to take into your future. This is especially true, I think, for first-generation college students who often don't take the traditional path straight from undergrad to graduate school. Please know that the skills, perseverance, and resilience that you are developing are incredibly helpful as you begin your research career. And know that there are many paths to your destination. Thank you. Dr. Altamibi, you're muted. We haven't, can't hear you. Thank you, Professor Rowland. That was very insightful. Our next speaker is Professor Suresh Babu. Professor Babu is the Governor's Chair of Advanced Manufacturing at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and is a professor based in the Department of Mechanical, Aerospace, and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Professor Babu has a bachelor's in engineering metallurgy from the PSG College of Technology in India, has a master's degree in the technology, industrial metallurgy and welding from the Indian Institute of Technology, and has a PhD from the University of Cambridge in the United States, uh, United Kingdom. Professor Babu is a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science, is a fellow of the ASM International and American Welding Society. Professor Babu, I know that you're taking the time to be with us and you're currently traveling. Uh, please allow me to advance your slides for you. Thank you, Modi. Can you hear me, Modi? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to the who are calling in and listening to us. It, I wish I was there in person to talk to all of you. And it's a great opportunity to converse with you through a panel. And uh, you might have seen the title slide right now where my work revolves around Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the University of Tennessee. Every day, the students shown in the my, uh, picture there, they teach me what to do about advanced materials and manufacturing. So with that, can you go to the next slide outline, please, Moody? Yes. Okay, so Moody already gave me a little bit of uh, introduction about my where I've been. So the most important thing, as Dr. Betsy Rollin has talked about a few minutes back, interdisciplinary expertise and everything comes by working with wide, dispersed team. And in my career, I was fortunate enough to work with a lot of people who mentored me along the way. So with that, uh, let me go to the next thing. What do I do right now? So right now in my role, as uh, if you go to the next slide, um, Moody, you would see a bridge showing up. So I jokingly say my job is to have a bridge between University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and ORNL. So if you build a bridge, people walk all over you. And that's what happens to me every um, time my students and the uh, faculty move back and forth between UT and OR and the collaboration. It's a very rich environment to collaborate. I wish all of you can visit OR and L one day and we can show you off all the things. And you can see there the students are pursuing different areas. There's an interdisciplinary uh, research and education as a part of the medicine center, which I direct to. With that, if you go to the next slide, you, you'll see Professor Susan Oxley's picture. And this is talks about convergence in research and education. This is like essentially Dr. Betsy Rowland, he touched upon that and showing that if you are going after a very challenging problem or so, 
most often the solution will never be in your own field you need to be able to open to talk to the other field and also talk to people with a different way of looking at things and sometimes the solution will present itself and then you will innovate quickly so that means you need to have a lot of interactions with them so you could see in professor susan hartfield lecture if you go into the video and you can see how mit uh, spun many companies around that also so i would strongly recommend listening to her video also when you have time so if you go to the next slide and you will see a title slide which says what happens in ornl mdf so i do not have a lot of time to talk about a lot of exciting projects happen so i will walk you through a few of them and showing that how the interdisciplinary research occurs uh, so moody if you go to the next slide you will see a lot of people's uh, pictures there and each one of the pictures i put there is because each one of them contributed and led the project where i became a contributor to to various areas so one of the talk uh, one of the areas which i'm going to uh, present is uh, sarah is one of my master student so when he, she came on board to join manufacturing demonstration facility so we were working on a lot of 3d metal printing and she introduced the idea of in situ monitoring so i do not have an expertise on infrared thermography so sarah went and found out uh, resources within ornl brought people together developed the system and deployed it and then she wrote a very classic paper showing that how in situ monitoring plays a big role in qualification of 3d printed metal parts so that actually is becoming a, a thread throughout all the projects we do right now so that's the one example here so that shows that you need to have a lot of people working together sharing ideas sometimes arguing about in depth what needs to be done to solve a particular problem so now having told about 3d printing i would like you to go to the next slide and many of you must have heard about 3d printing if you take any popular media or anything you notice that so the reason uh, our group is very much interested in uh, in ornl and ut is this allows you to develop new materials where combination of properties cannot be achieved by one single process this is we are in a second slide where you can see on your left hand side a colored images where different combination of properties are there if you think about it our own human body is like the hybrid material so it has different materials with different properties put together so the same way can we engineer them using 3d printing so that is one of the goals of our uh, work with that you can actually produce complex robots which is shown in the next slide next uh, panel and then the other panel is talks about uh, components which will go into aircrafts also so now having shown this with the interdisciplinary expertise we can do 3d uh, metal printed parts and uh, so next challenge for us is if you go to the next uh, slide um uh, hoodie which talks about immediate opportunity this is where i recommend all of you who are listening please come and work with us so this is a challenging project uh, or and is taken up on and our director is uh, behind this to make sure we can make a new design of transmission challenge reactor using wide range of techniques even though 3d printing can be there but we cannot get to the finish line without expertise from different areas listed there So if you are in the one of the areas there please try to come to Oak Ridge and work with us in the team if we can meet this challenging project to do that at the end of the four years or so we would like to make a working re- reactor with a very high efficiency and safety also and if you are interested in learning more you can go into the web and uh, type in transformation challenge reactor okay now you can see that there are a lot of areas we are bringing into disciplinary skills together going after challenging project you may wonder okay how can we be local community impact so that takes us to the, my next slide and this is where i like to be very proud to introduce one of my students john aaron jones who is there in the picture there so he worked with ornl and ut ut faculties provide educational and seeing in depth science and the ornl manufacturing demonstration facility provided them exposure to the advanced uh, 3d printing technique so with that he actually was able to be a part of an afrl project that led to 
launching his own company called Volunteer Aerospace. And he makes components which goes into aircraft structures and aerospace sectors too. So that clearly shows that having an interdisciplinary approach not only allows you to push the scientific frontiers, he can also provide a local impact. So currently, uh, John Aaron Jones is employing around 10 people in addition to himself working for his wife. It's shown here also. His wife is the CEO of the company too. So with that, I'd like to go to the, my summary slide. So materials and manufacturing is the rare area I work on it. There are a lot of exciting and challenging opportunities, but however, the only way we can achieve them is through interdisciplinary skills, which can look at the materials at different length and time scale. And often, we, you, I would like you to talk about engineering solution is most available in the literature. You just have to bring it out through teamwork and putting it together. Like many times you're carrying your iPhone or mobile computers and everything that all came about by doing the interdisciplinary research and team science. So a few tips for all of us is that do not be afraid to ask questions. There's no question called stupid questions. You can always ask. That is how you learn. And always look for where you do not have expertise and reach out and work hard and fail fast and find answers. With that, so the last aspect is when you learn all of this, please pay it forward to others too. With that, I'll give this uh, um, back to Moody, all yours. Thank you very much, Professor Babu. Our next speaker is Dr. Merlin Theodore. She is currently the group leader in advanced fibers and the director for the fiber, the carbon fiber technology facility at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Dr. Merlin, right. Hello, received... yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Moody. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, share with the students the diverse backgrounds in each one of your degrees. Um, she has a bachelor in chemical engineering, a master's in mechanical engineering, and a PhD in material science and engineering from Tatsiki University. Floor is yours, Merlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize, Moody. Uh, my camera is, is, is not working right now, so I can't really see you. But thank you for that great introduction. Again, my name is Merlin Theodore, and yes, it's pronounced like Merlin, like the magician, but unfortunately, I have no magic. Um, my presentation, I, I took a little slightly turn, different turn on this to give you my perspective um, with the commercial manufacturing world versus R&D based on my past experiences. Um, so I'm going to give you, you know, a, a synopsis on how R&D efforts complement the commercial world and what we do at Oak Ridge National Lab in the advanced manufacturing program. With that being said, if you, I think, go to the next slide, Moody. In any manufacturing facility, um, the goal is definitely to reduce costs, reduce scrap, and save energy, improve throughput, throughput efficiency, as well as quality of the product in addition to on-time delivery of the product. In addition to that, you do have some manufacturing facilities that are interested in creating innovation in order to stay abreast of their technology area and also to stay ahead of their competitors. These efforts are only um, realized through operational ex excellence. And I will give you a little background about that. I actually work in that area for quite some time. Operational excellence can simply be described as an element in organizational leadership and ideology that embraces methodology and tools for problem solving as key to continuous improvement. When you're in a commercial world, in a manufacturing setting, there's only so much you can do to reduce and improve uh, efficiency of, of the process. Uh, eventually, that potential of reducing costs and improving quality gets narrow and narrow. And the only way to break through that is definitely to seek guidance from science, research, and development. And this is the only way that manufacturing companies today can sustain or remain competitive. In today's economic system, companies must diversify to remain competitive. With that being said, in order to diversify, you definitely need a diverse and multidisciplinary team of people with different backgrounds and perspectives 
which leads to better decision making, better ideas, more more productivity, new perspective, greater innovation, and higher engagement in the workplace. With that being said, along um, those lines, and part of that multidisciplinary team is definitely a team of engineers, and I specifically focus on that because my understanding, the group that I am speaking to is a group of engineering students. So in that sense, um, I will talk to you about the applied science facilities, which more specifically, it's two of them that falls under the Advanced Manufacturing Program at Oak Ridge National Lab. And before I go on to the next slide, I do want to say that engineering is applied science in a sense. Um, applied science build the knowledge, seek to learn, understand, model, and predict, and um, address issues associated in current world problems. And engineering turns those knowledge into technology. Next slide, Moody. So the Advanced Manufacturing Program at ONL, there's two user facilities that, that, that is housed under that program. It's the MBF, the Manufacturing Demonstration Facility that Babu uh, Suresh mentioned a little bit earlier, and the Carbon Fiber Technology Facility. Those two facilities were built for addressing uh, challenges associated with additive manufacturing and challenges associated with carbon fiber and composite uh, manufacturing. This was all done to help increase America competitiveness. As you may or may not know, a lot of these technologies are internationally owned. Um, so one of the goal of our facilities is to enable domestic commercial sources in these technology areas. We work with a wide variety of consortiums, uh, consortiums being academic consortiums as well as industry-led consortiums, so that we can transfer technology for commercialization. We work with everyone across the entire supply chain in these two technology areas. I'm gonna drill down a little bit more in both of those uh, areas, uh, give you a chance to see what our capabilities are in those user facilities as well. So you can imagine between those two facilities under the Advanced Manufacturing Program, we work with a vast range of different disciplines. To move to the next slide, Moody. The next slide represents our core pillars in the Advanced Manufacturing uh, Program. We have five core pillars, and across those pillars, we've introduced a digital platform. I think Shiresh mentioned earlier that he had a student that started the in-situ measurement initiative. That initiative has now spanned across pretty much much of our pillars today. Um, so those pillars are additive manufacturing, again, carbon fiber and composites, intelligent machine tools, roll-to-roll -to -roll processing, and robotics. And there on the bottom, you can see the digital platform. So you can imagine the type of individuals that work in this area. I mean, we're working with material scientists, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, electricians, physicists, simulation and, and module uh, modeling research scientists, data analytics scientists, a wide range, cybersecurity scientists, a very wide range of, of disciplines here. At Oak Ridge National Lab, we have pretty much much of all the expertise that is needed at hand. You will not work in a commercial world or much other places where you can pretty much pick up the phone and call and someone that is an expertise in the area that you need help. Um, it's, it's pretty effective to have that, that different types of discipline here at Oak Ridge National Lab. It helps us to expedite research to commercialization. Next slide, Moody. Um, so that's really at a high level, the advanced manufacturing program. The, the carbon fiber technology facility was developed for addressing carbon fiber um, challenges. As you know, carbon fiber is considered a critical material for the future. It is the material that offers the highest uh, potential weight loss in light weighting and high uh, volume energy application. However, it has the highest risk. So this facility was developed for addressing those challenges, <coughs> producing carbon fiber from lower cost uh, precursor material to reduce the cost to lower than $5 per pound, but also to enable uh, domestic commercial sources of this material, excuse me. <coughs> I, 
I am now going to take you into the facility itself so that you can actually see some of the capabilities within this facility. Moody, I don't know if you can open that link for me and navigate for me. It doesn't seem that I can open that link. Uh, yes. We can't link to it now, but they're part of the slide deck that will be shared with the audience. Okay. Uh, but just so you know, everyone, you can tour some of these facilities uh, virtually. Okay, so I'll just talk about the capabilities that we have in here then, Moody. And then when you share this, they'll have the opportunity to actually see the actual equipment on the floor. So you can go back one slide. The carbon fiber technology facility is the only of its kind in the U.S. Um, it is the only open access facility in the U.S. as well. One thing I do want to mention, Oak Ridge National Lab is the only national lab where you can work um, in research and development efforts from raw materials all the way to full scale products. We are the only person that can do this. I think it's very um very great for the simple fact that you have a lot of researchers that work on problems and never know or never see the end result of, of their research work and you can see that here to me it makes a researcher work very very different when they see their work is actually implemented in something that is real so we're working on real life problems and issues today that the researchers themselves can see for themselves what happened and the initiative that they have provided to help us to get to solutions um, the carbon fiber facility, go back two slides, Moody. The carbon fiber facility has a, a semi-production carbon fiber line that is rated for 25 tons per year and a milk spinning line that is rated for um, 70, I think 25 tons a year each. Um, there we can scale up, and then this is the last scale just before commercialization. So it's in a sense, it's somewhat of a commercial world combined with a research world. Um, we also have other capabilities for making intermediates from these carbon fibers and then um, compositing system as well. In the manufacturing demonstration facility, you can go to the next slide, is where we do all of our 3D printing or additive manufacturing work. We have, I think, to date over 100 systems, large scale. Go back, uh, go back to the manufacturing facility slide. This one? Yeah. One more, one more right there. Um, go forward one more and stop right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think you're going back. Okay, sorry about that. You want me to go I forward? Think I'll take it. That's okay, I'll take it from here. Yeah, so, so right here. So this facility houses over 100 uh, additive manufacturing system. We can print anything from a vehicle. You can see right there to the bottom left, that's the Cobra that was 3D printed, I believe, in 24 hours. Um, and that was actually done at a conference. Um, we have a whole fleet of um, 3D printed transportation, different, we have submarines, we have a utility van, house, and so forth. So there's a lot that we can do at this scale at, at, at the MDF. There is a lot of first of capabilities as well that was born here. And a lot of companies to date that have been born due to the um, cooperative, collaborative research and development efforts between industry partners and Oak Ridge National Lab researchers. So going to the next slide, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, we work with everyone across the supply chain. When you're in the commercial world, you pretty much work with the customer base for that particular manufacturer. Whereas at Oak Ridge National Lab, you get to work with a wide range of industry partners across the entire supply chain, from uh, raw material suppliers to equipment vendors to a wide range of end users. This is a snapshot of IACME. It's the Institute for Advanced Composites and Manufacturing Innovation. Uh, it's a consortium that house, I think, I believe 150 companies to date, over 31 states. Uh, these are the companies that we work for. It is, it is not the only company that we work with. We also work with a lot of other companies, government agencies, and different academia as well um, to help in the advanced manufacturing program and address real-life real challenges. 
So this opened up a lot of opportunities for you. This is where a lot of our researchers get to work hand in hand with industry partners and in a lot of cases end up getting employed by these industry partners. My next slide, which I'm just going to go over really quick, I mentioned earlier that Oak Ridge National Lab is the only laboratory where you can deliver on your research and development efforts from raw material all the way to full-scale full parts. At the bottom of that slide is all the facilities. You can see a little inside shot of the carbon fiber technology facility, which is the second picture here. Um, but this is our strategic approach in carbon fiber, and this is just to show you how we go from raw material all the way to full part, and that's unheard of in most places. But it is very useful for the students as well as the industry partners to understand all the issues across the scale and how it impacts the final properties of the raw material, including the final part. And on this next slide, just to give you an example of a real life problem that we had very recently, as you guys are all aware, it was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Oak Ridge National Lab was called upon to help in, in this area. Um, we actually work again across the entire supply chain. So we pulled a team of uh, members from the different national labs as well as industry partners to help not only on making masks, but also test tubes for, for testing um, different samples, uh, molds for actually making a mask at faster rates pretty much everything across the COVID-19 supply chain. And I just wanted to give you that as an example. It's not often you get to work on real life problems. So this, this slide represents the efforts that we did on just one part of that, which was the social media for making the N95 mask. As everyone know, there was a great shortage in that area. Um, we started that initiative on April 1st when we were called upon to help in that area by April 28, we were able to achieve the N95 targets for making that filter media. We then created the electrostatic, electrostatic device that is needed for the process. And then we transfer all of that technology to an industry partner called Cummins Filtration. And now today, in less than five weeks, taking into consideration, not taking into consideration the time for parts, Cummings is now producing full scale, 100 enough social media for 1 million masks a day. We then connected <coughs> Cummings with another industry partner for making masks, and that partner today is making 3 million surgical masks and a half million and 95 masks today. So that's just, just that's just one example on a real life problem, very recent, that Oak Ridge National Lab was presented with and how we were able to help make a great impact in the U.S. And this is what exactly what we're trying to do across the Advanced Manufacturing Program. And last but not least, I made myself the last because I can talk about myself all day, but as Moody mentioned earlier, I have a bachelor's in chemical engineering, a master's in mechanical, and a PhD in material science engineering. That gives me a great advantage to my peers simply because it makes you more vert versatile. <clears throat> Very unique find for a lot of applications because you can work more than one area because those degrees complement each other. Um, after my bachelor's, uh, I went to Bayer Pharmaceutical uh, as a quality control. While I was there, I didn't have the best grades, to be honest with you guys, and it was pretty hard for me to get into the engineering department with the grades that I had. So I kept going to this job board, and I noticed that there was a particular job that was there for over six months, and I was like, why, why they cannot fill this position? Well, I found out that that position was requiring a PhD, so I decided to go back to school and get my PhD because I wanted that job. Um, on the way to getting my PhD, I did get my, my MS in mechanical engineering and then my PhD. Once I left the university, I was working at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base as a postdoc, but also as a technical advisor and advanced on the uh, minority leader program. So I was responsible for the educational task, developing the uh, summer programs and making sure that we pull the right candidate students into Black Patterson Air Force Base to work on different projects that were mission-led. Uh, upon leaving Wright Patterson Air Force Base, I went to Georgia Tech University as a research faculty and started the Common Fiber 
a pilot plant there. I was there for a very short time before I moved on to work with the SGL BMW Joint Center that made the carbon fiber for the BMW i-Series. You can see a picture of that there. I believe that's the i8. Um, and now today, I am here at Oak Ridge National Lab leading the carbon fiber technology facility, as mentioned earlier. I am also the director of the composite material and process and technology area for the Institute for Advanced Composites and Manufacturing Innovation that I mentioned earlier that have over 150 industry uh, partners. And I believe that is my life slide, Moody. Thank you very much, Merlin. Uh, our final speaker is Dr. Hector Santos Velalopos. Hector is the senior R&D staff leader of the Cyber Identity and Biometrics Group and manager of the Identity Science Program at Oak Ridge National Lab. Hector received his bachelor's and master's of science from the Department of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at the University of Puerto Rico, received his PhD from the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University. In 2011, he was one of the recipients of the GIST and JEI Tech Award for an outstanding and original research publication on imaging science and engineering concerning his doctoral work. Hector, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Moody. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Uh, I love to work uh, with students. Uh, I see a few of you. I see uh, uh, Joseph, Jeffrey, uh, June, Lynn. Uh, and I'm not going to mention all of you, but, but I'm glad that you're here. Uh, so I, I was really happy to hear the previous presentations because it gave a pretty good background, especially Dr. Roland uh, uh, overview on team uh, research and efficiency and performance. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is to give you an example uh, of how that looked like. Uh, my background is in in identity sciences, like a biometrics, uh, computational imaging. I like to play with systems. Uh, I like to modify them so that I can overcome the limitations of the conventional uh, uh, system. And, and I will look for different things to identify people uh, or groups of people. Uh, we can use the face, we can use the iris, DNA, but, but also we can look into uh, the, the walk gait, or we can look at your ear, or we can uh, look at the way you, you talk, uh, uh, the way you type, or many behaviors, uh, even your social networks and your connections. And, and that's very important for our national security. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I like to do things that are out of the norm. Uh, so uh, I like to use tools, actually my research, I do that a lot, use the tools that we have to accomplish something. So you, you, we have been talking about the Q&A box to make questions. So let's see if this works. I, I have a game for you in a little bit, and we're going to use that so that you can answer some of my questions. So you will go to that Q&A, and I will make a question, and you are going to answer. It's going to be quick. Uh, but going back to my presentation, the, uh, the, the identity uh, research is interdisciplinary, uh, transdisciplinary. Uh, we, we have to use psychologists, uh, uh, mechanical engineers, optical engineers, uh, machine learning, computer vision, uh, you name it. There, there is a very broad, very specific in terms of what we are trying to solve. We are trying to, uh, to identify uh, people or group of people, but then very broad in the skills that you need to get the job done. Uh, uh, something that I, that I told uh, Moody is that talking to students like you that are very successful, uh, I would love to see you getting into the national security space. We, we, need, we need scientists, uh, we need people passionate about these kind of problems because our country uh, needs you, uh, and, and, and more today than ever. So this is an example of the people that work with me. Uh, over 20 people from different departments, uh, different directorates, uh, chemists, uh, we have uh, uh, physicists, uh, and we have engineers, and, and it's a pleasure to work with them. Uh, most of the of, of the uh, most interesting solutions uh, came when when this group of people we we get together we brainstorm about how to solve something and then we can enrich ideas from the background that each other have so it does extremely interesting I, I always I always say that 
uh, the, the lab of Cluj National Laboratory is a, is a Disney for scientists because you can find an expert on anything and, and, and then work with them and then achieve a very impactful uh, research. Uh, so let's see, let's see if we can do this. Are we ready to do the, the, the Q&A? Let's see, I'm going, we, we try, if it doesn't work, uh, we keep going. So you see a slide and you see there is a fingerprint to the left. So how far do you think that fingerprint is from the sensor? And you're going to give me a number in meters. How many meters do you think there is there? What is the space between the camera and the fingerprint? In meters. Let's see. No one, no one there too. So let's see, okay, so let's continue. So this is, oh, 0.1 meters. Okay, we have one. Uh -huh. Anyone else there? One, one meter, I guess. So that's 20 meters. So that, that image was captured at, at 20 meters. For this iris, quickly, uh, how far that iris is? 0.2 meters, okay. Anyone else? Point twenty five meters. So that iris was captured at eight meters. And then the last one, this is the last one. Uh, those faces, how far they are, are they? In meters. Twenty meters. Wow. It's 10 meters. Okay. 10 meters also. A thousand meters. Man, I like that. I like that. <laughs> uh, so that one was captured at 600 meters. And actually, we have pictures where we are able to recognize people at 1.2 kilometers. Uh, and, and, and this is done by combining physics, by combining uh, algorithms, uh, machine learning, computer vision, uh, 3D printing parts, like putting everything together, uh, and, and that's what we love to do. And, and the more uh, integrated we are, the better we are as a team. So, so those things that uh, Dr. Roland was, was uh, mentioning at the beginning, they, they are really true, and, and we need to have that diverse uh, team uh, to, to really tackle these really hard problems. Uh, just to give you a few, a few examples very quickly, uh, the sensor to the, to the left that's a, a, an artificial intelligence sensor. Uh, so we, we try to sample the scene uh, with three different cameras. They will have different polarizers, uh, different density filters, and then we use AI to fuse these images to generate a better face image. Uh, pretty, pretty neat for this application is that we also train the AI model to remove some of the artifacts and some of the non-idealities of the, of the image. As you can see to, at the bottom, at bottom left, there is one image that has this glare. So by using these techniques, we can remove that and provide this really nice face. Something that we are working on that we are very passionate is about trying to reconstruct your face from DNA. So you have a DNA strain and, and, and you want to know who that person, who, who, what is the face of that person. Uh, we are trying to develop uh, uh, artificial intelligence models to achieve that. And we do that with scientists that they are working with plants. So we have a great uh, research like uh, on, in biology, trying to do phenotyping DNA to, fe to plant phenotype for energy uh, uh, problems. And then we are taking that technology and, and use that for biometrics. And, and I always have a joke like, uh, for, for that is that uh, in, usually you collect DNA for forensics. You know, you, there is a bad guy, there is a crime scene, and you collect DNA or you collect, you collect fingerprints. The sad part is that you cannot go and pose a DNA strain or a fingerprint and say, have you seen this fingerprint somewhere? Uh, you, cannot, you cannot do that, but you can do a face. You can say, hey, have you seen this face before? And we are getting closer and closer to have something uh, useful in this field. Also for data analytics. So we are trying to extract automatically as much as we can from faces. Um, is the person sick? Is the person like I has glasses? Is the person Puerto Rican or, or, or from the uh, Middle East? And, and what can we learn from faces? What faces can tell us? And this is extremely important. Uh, uh, Facebook, by using similar technology, 
they were able to remove um, child porn, more than 50,000 posts of child porn from their website. Uh, we, have, we have rescued in the past two years more than 10,000 uh, uh, women involved in human trafficking by being able to find, uh, using face recognition and these technologies to find these people that are lost, uh, 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 you know, into the into the into dark places. So so this technology is very important for our society, for our national security, and these are the problems that we like to solve. And it requires many different skills, people from different fields, and the more uh, diverse we are and different we are, better perspectives and, and ways to tackle uh, these uh, 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 problems. So so finally, uh, I, I wanted to to leave you. Uh, some of my some of my projects, I, I I love to work with students. I like to bring students from all over the U.S. and and the, the experience is is uh, in, un unvaluable. Like a, they they always come up with really unique, fresh uh, ideas that we can uh, implement and 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 take what we are doing to the next level. And also they they leave the lab with the with the with in happiness and and feeling reward because they can see. Well, for example, those sensors that 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 we developed with them, it took us like a six to 10 weeks to develop a, a, a prototype that we were able to take to the field and, and they can feel very proud about it. So I, I wanted to, to leave you with, with, a, with a few things. Uh, first, that I know that you are smart, that uh, you guys are, have, have achieved a lot uh, in, in your young life and, and you want to be innovative. That's why, why we are here. And so if you want to be innovative, make sure that you have your fundamentals and you're working on that. Uh, work on your fundamentals uh, for science, for your expertise, uh, but also like a practice, practice those fundamentals. Uh, that, that will be the key for innovation when you actually have this knowledge and you try to use it and you see where it's not working and you can uh, uh, find a way to make it work. And also who is around you, who is the people around you as, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Suresh was uh, mentioning, try to give back. Uh, I, I wrote here in my notes that, that if you are passionate, smart, and work hard, uh, you will be able to get very far. Uh, but if you, if you are all that, and, and also develop strong, healthy relationship with people that are smart, and want to work hard, and want to solve hard problems, you can change the world. So, so hopefully we can give you uh, a glimpse at what is research and what is uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary uh, research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hector. I know we have a few uh, minutes uh, uh, left and uh, we'll stay beyond the one hour to answer some of your questions. But really there is a, 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 a to wait to summarize all the panelists. Uh, this is a quote from Alvin Weinberg, one of the former directors of Oak Ridge National Lab in 1967, that tells you the importance of team science and the innovation that it brings it uh, um, with it. Is in basic research, the strength of laboratories like ORNL lies in the interdisciplinary composition of their staffs. Over and over again, it has been demonstrated that the whole can be greater than the sum of its part, that good people from diverse fields working together can make major scientific discoveries that are denied geniuses working alone. And to open up the uh, floor for discussion, um, I know that we have some questions. One is, was that Tom Hanks as a child, Hector? So yes, that's Tom Hanks. Uh, so part of our research is to try to recognize uh, adults from their children, from their child, like a picture uh, for missing children. And, and so, so that's part of the work that we do. And, 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 and yes, uh, we use a lot of celebrity pictures uh, to train our models. Great. Uh, also, there is a question to all panel members, and I'm not sure like if uh, uh, Hector uh, or uh, uh, Professor Roland can answer that. A few panelists have spoken about teaming up to take on real life challenges. What challenges besides COVID do you mean? And how uh, do multidisciplinary teams work? So I, I can take that. Uh, so interdisciplinary teams work when we trust each other. Uh, so th there have to be some humbleness uh, on us to recognize the things that we do well and the things that we don't do well. 
And then we need to allow uh, other people and recognize the value that other people bring to those teams. Uh, so then you let them do what they do well. Uh, the, the, when that's, when, at least that's my experience, and, and Dr. Uh, Roland can do say better than me. Uh, in my experience, when, when people recognize their strengths and weaknesses, and they are willing to be transparent with each other, then you have this bonding inside the team. When that happens, then even your weaknesses become strengths because you, you, you can express how uh, uh, me as a, probably a, a naive uh, expert on a certain area, and uh, with naive knowledge in a certain area, I can say, what about this solution? Or mm -hmm. what about seeing that problem in a different way? And then the expert can look at it and say, oh, wow, oh, that's great, Hector. That, that's a great uh, uh, idea because we can do this, we can do that because he has or she has the expertise. So, so that transparency and bonding is very important. Uh, real world examples. Um, there are plenty. Uh, for example, what, um, what, I, what I show you when we are trying to develop systems uh, for recognition, uh, it involves uh, uh, different skills. I have a project trying to do deception detection. So we are trying to find if someone is lying. And, and for that project, I have people that they are completely in the psychology field. We have experts at what they do is psychology. Uh, while we are doing that analytics or we are doing some signal processing, and, and those are real problems. And when you have like a high impact problems, usually you have a mix of experts uh, working on it. I, I can you. add to that as well, Moody. Marlon? Yes. If, if that's okay, I can add to that Please. really quick. Another real life problem example is the petroleum industry as well as the coal industry um, produces pitch material, which is considered scrap in their distillation process. As I mentioned earlier, most companies want to reduce scrap or eliminate scrap. Um, so one of the issues was how do we do that? So one of the things that we're doing at the carbon fiber facility is taking that scrap material and actually making high value carbon fiber products from that material. We have developed technologies to do so and on the, on the path to commercialization. That's it, Moody. Oh, thank you, Merlin. Uh, these are all very insightful. We do have another question uh, about uh, to uh, Professor Roland. What are the challenges, some of the challenges that uh, you can overcome with communications across multidisciplinary team? And after that, we have time for two more questions. Great. So when I start working with teams that are working across multiple disciplines, we start by having conversations about the problem space that the team is trying to solve. What I found over the years is that the, if the team starts to uh, starts talking first about their approaches and their and their their own research questions, they stay stuck in their silos. But if we start by talking about what is the problem space that you're trying to trying to solve and trying to address, then people start thinking more broadly about um, especially what you know, what are the, who are the constituents that you're trying to serve? Um, one example is, of this is a team that I worked with here at Wisconsin that was putting in an NSF um, proposal for an engineering research center. And that, that center was going to be focused on the use of AI and sensors in fall prevention. You know, older adults, especially right when they get out of the hospital, they're at high risk of falling. And if they fall, they, you know, they get, they end up back in the hospital and then they, they frequently don't leave, they, they die there. And so using AI and sensors to predict who's at risk for fall or to you know, identify when someone has fallen and needs help. So at first we have the AI people and the data people and the sensor people and the clinicians all talking about what they would do to solve um, that their parts of the problem. But when they start talking about the higher level problem of falls prevention and keeping people out of the hospital, then the conversation really shifted. So really trying to get stay, stay focused on what it is you're trying to solve and who's who you're trying to serve with that research problem. Thank you, Professor Rowan. We have another question here is, can you please give us a glimpse on your latest research related to gait recognition? I believe this question is for you, Hector. I cannot tell you, I'm kidding. Yes, I, I can tell you. So, <laughs> so, so typically, so gait is a very hard problem. Uh, not too much of the science on how you how you remove the feature vector uh, that that you can match for that gate, 
The problem with gate is that clothing uh, can really add a lot of noise to that signal. So, so right now what, what I'm looking at is to try to find modalities uh, where we can look at uh, and, and basically be able to hit that joint and, and have a better measurement of the joints like uh, on, on the body. Uh, that, that's what, uh, what we are looking at. Something that we also do uh, is that we, when we are trying to recognize people, privacy and protecting our rights is very important. Uh, it's important for us, important for our sponsors. And, and so, so those are things that we always take in, con in consideration every time that we are building these kind of uh, systems. Thank you, Hector. Um, Merlin, uh, one last question before concluding uh, remarks. Um, you all have such varied backgrounds. Could someone who has a bachelor's and master's in just EE or computer engineering have an impact on these teams? And I guess you work with the largest team, uh, um, Merlin. Absolutely. Absolutely, because you can bring a different perspective. As Ms. Dr. Volan mentioned earlier, a lot of people work in silos. Um, but you can then bring a different perspective to the different teams because you have more of an understanding, um, you know, granted that you have background in those different areas that can complement each other. To be really honest with you, that, that my background has given me the advantage over a lot of my peers in the positions that I have worked in. Thank you for that. So um, we're run out of time, and I'd like to thank our STEAM panelists for uh, being with us today. And also, I'd like to give each one of you uh, uh, the opportunity to just say one concluding remark. And uh, if you do have any questions, our panel members have uh, graciously provided us their contact information. And if you are interested in working as an intern or postdoctoral researcher with any of our scientists and engineers, please do uh, uh, let us know. There are many, many opportunities that are available. This will give you um, training in team science and innovation. Um, student internships are on pause to come to the lab because of COVID, but we're looking forward to that changing uh, soon. Uh, please do forward your questions to us, uh, additional questions to uh, Professor Rollins, Suresh Babu, um, Hector Santos Villalopos, and Merlin Theodore. So please, we'll start with you, uh, Professor Rowland. Thank you. Again, thank you for having me today. I think that the one concluding thought that I would share with you is that the ability to collaborate and to work on teams and to do interdisciplinary research is a skill set that you can develop over the course of your career. Some people come to it naturally, but most of us have had to work at it and to develop those skills. So I just encourage you to think about and be cognizant of how you're working with others and, and, and work to, to develop that skill set. Thank you. Professor Babu, if you're still with us, I know you were driving. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so if you can hear me, the only parting uh, dialogue with all of you is that uh, for the students who are calling in. So there are so many national laboratories around the U.S. and which all give you opportunity to do team science and realize your dream. So just dream on and go and work with those researchers and use this infrastructure and go change the world. And uh, I really envy all of you. And with that, I'll give it back to Modi. Thank you, Professor Babu. Merlin, would you like to share some parting thoughts with the audience? I would say as far as uh, parting thoughts to add on to what Dr. Rowland say, one thing I would say um, as far as being part of a multidisciplinary team is definitely trust and understanding the individuals within that team really goes a long way, as simple as it sounds. Understanding the different cultures that they're from and so forth and how to work with these individuals will help, will help you quite a bit. And that's all I have, Moody. Thank you, Merlin. Now it's your turn, Hector, please. So I, I will repeat what I what I said at, at the end of my presentation. Uh, you are young, yeah. You guys are young, uh, have a lot to offer, um, and 
keep working your craft, keep uh, working on your expertise, but the best investment that you can do for your career is to invest in others. Uh, develop that network, develop your club of crazy scientist friends and engineers that want, want to change the world uh, and always uh, try to achieve your dreams uh, uh, and you will, you will have a very rewarding and, and happy life. Thank you everyone for the opportunity and we look forward to hearing from all of you. Again, our slides are available uh, to your benefit and thank you IEEE, Ada Kapanu, Stacy, um, for helping us uh, get together and helping us organize this panel. I hope you all have thank a wonderful day. So thank you so much, Moody and the panelists. This is Nancy Yosin, the director, and I really enjoyed this. Moody, when we sat and planned this out, talked about innovation and team science, I knew it would be an awesome panel, and you've certainly exceeded our expectations. I do want to say one thing about the National Lab. I think we could put a subset of national treasure underneath of it. So again, we really were uh, happy to bring this information to our students and our EDACAP and new members. Hector, your words really resonate into what is EDACAP and you all about. But thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, panelists.